Video games and music have had a very long history, from some of the catchy 8-bit tracks of Super Mario Brothers to the eclectic radio stations of Grand Theft Auto. But music's moving into interesting new frontiers now, with Marshmallow playing a live concert to over 10 million people within the game of Fortnite. The Royal Albert Hall behind me has held many concerts that have orchestral renditions of video game soundtracks. So how do we get to the stage where video games could sell out classical venues? What does that mean for video games and music moving forward? So Ape How is a fantastic example of how video game music can evolve and serve the gameplay. The soundtrack is improv jazz in the sense that it's procedurally generated. You've got a jazz drummer who's getting wilder and wilder to accompany the gameplay. So as the gameplay evolves, get more intense, you've got more enemies coming from left to right, the drums start getting more intense, you've got more crash cymbals, you've got more crazy tom fills, and it's just a fantastic example of how not only music can serve the gameplay, but how the two can work together. The most creative use of music in a video game has to be Rayman Legends with Black Betty. So there's a particular level where, as you run through it in a sort of side-scrolling manner, Black Betty, the song is playing, and the enemies will like pop out their heads on the beat of the song, and as you go, you kind of progress the music, and it's all in time with each other, and it's perfect. When it comes to music creativity in video games, Nintendo is probably up there as one of the best. Particularly the Mount Wario stage in Mario Kart 8. Depending on where you are in the actual track, different parts of the music will play. And if you're going pretty slowly, the music will add in additional kind of loops to kind of keep the music going. And then when you're on the final stretch, all the instruments are playing and it's blaring out to make you feel triumphant. Like it's one of the most creative uses of music that is so subtle, but it's timed to perfection every single time you play that track. Writing music for video games as opposed to film is actually an incredibly difficult and different process. We thought we'd sit down with Hybrid, a group who've got over 20 years experience making music for both. You guys have had a really illustrious career. You know, you've made uh, music for film, music for games. What would you say are some of the biggest differences between making you know, music for games and music for film? You've got to immerse yourself in the characters and the situation just like you would in a film. So, you know, you still have to get the player to be completely immersed in that experience. But the differences are kind of like... Well, the music you deliver would be just in a different kind of format. Obviously, it's going to be linear for a film. So you've got your point A to point B and, and beyond. But for the games from the experiences that we've had, it's very much more bite-sized pieces that you then kind of fit together depending on the gameplay. Drive Club that we did for Sony, they didn't want music during the gameplay because they were so obsessive about all the car sounds and they'd done multi-channel oh, recordings of all these incredible cars. Mm. They wanted it just to have a real experience, but then you had something really booming for the for the replays. Some of the other stuff we've done, like Ghost Recon, that, that we had the, yeah, we had the most incredible brief. I mean, it was literally 17 seconds precisely of this. Oh, wow. And then, and it's also got to do this and this. So there's version A, version B, version C. 20 or 30 even levels of different permutations just for one scene which will then be mixed by the game engine so it's a whole different world and yeah it's... so if that fight scene does stop you know you're just gonna naturally and as i said like invisibly pit down to something that's just more of a kind of constant while you go make a cup of tea or whatever so you know it's just you've got to have so many little bits and bobs so that you can slot in and not get repetitive so you know you need lots of options so people don't get bored <laughs> For me, the most iconic game soundtrack that's a licensed one is going to be Crazy Taxi. 
or Tony Hawk's Pro Skater? Tony Hawk Pro Skater 2. Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 3. I played that loads when I was a teenager, was absolutely obsessed with that game. That introduced me to most of the bands I listen to today, some of my favourite bands, Goldfinger, AFI. Rage Against the Machine, Papa Roach. The Offspring and Bad Religion. In Crazy Taxi, Bad Religion is one of the bands featured, and I still really love that band. I discovered them through the game, and in a sense it was life-changing, in that that really turned me on to that sort of punk music. A couple of years later, I was in a band playing that sort of music. I remember Guitar Hero and Rock Band were some of the first uh, games I could play with my friends who weren't really into video games, but Rock Band really brought us together. We were all these 11, 12 year old girls who were playing like ACDC and all of this, which maybe usually we wouldn't have been into, but we ended up getting this really kind of 80s rock taste of music through playing Rock Band. There's only one game that needs to be in the conversation, and that's Wu-Tang Clan Taste the Pain. Are you ready? Are you bad inside? Got you strapped down to your seats. It had original music from the Wu-Tang Clan. Yes, that's Ghostface, Jizza, Rizza, Master Killer, Method Man, Raekwon, Yuga, Inspector, all of them, all of them were there. If you ain't played it on the PlayStation 1, go play. Video game music isn't all about just having a furious pace to kind of drive you through your experience. It is also about emotion as well. And what we're finding more and more with games is they're getting more and more complicated with their music. Entire symphonies are being written and performed just to help you feel that moment that they want you to feel within the game. And uh, I figured if we were going to talk to someone about writing a giant symphony, we should probably chat to someone who won a BAFTA for it. I didn't come from the world of video games and when I wrote my first score, Dear Esther, I didn't know what I was doing. So I essentially wrote a film soundtrack for a game. Yeah. And then I thought, oh, hang on, games are interactive. And then I kind of learned to be an interactive composer and that is a completely different thing. And it just requires a different skill set and you're trying to support the player through their journey. So it's really complex emotionally and technically because you're also, as well as signposting them how to feel, you're also saying, I don't want you to stay here for very long, or I'd rather you went left here. In terms of the designer saying, it's more interesting to go left. The music has to be able to signpost that. At what point are you kind of brought into that process? It's kind of like, how long is a piece of string? In terms of some games composers, it works on the filmic model, where they're brought in right at the end of the process. Okay. What I would say the most successful games are, the really famous games, they've been really smart. The developers have brought the composers in at a much earlier stage. If you think of something like Journey, yeah. uh, with music by Austin Wintory, he worked on that game for three years. And you can absolutely tell, because in terms of supporting player experience, he knew that game backwards. I think he probably knew it better than that game company because he'd just played it thousands and thousands of times. The best game composers working in the industry are absolutely involved in that process and it's a, a, a true collaboration I'd say. So I'm just as likely to be having a conversation with a programmer or a game designer as I am just sitting in my room writing themes by myself and I love that aspect of it. Oh, you do a radio show all about video game music. Are you quite surprised that that's sort of become a thing that there are enough people kind of out there who are like oh yeah let's have a listen. There was such a massive appetite for it and nobody was doing it and mm. Classic FM just harnessed that energy they were I think it was really amazing that they went hang on there's a really good opportunity here so people who'd never played games loved it and people who would never listen to Classic FM started listening. Last year I presented an evening of games music at the Royal Albert Hall. That was nearly 6,000 people and so many people came up to me afterwards and said I've never heard an orchestra play live before. So for me demystifying, opening it up, the more games music that is out there, it's just a win-win situation of going it's amazing music, new audiences, young audiences, it's a no-brainer. Live video game music concerts are really really big business. There's concerts for all sorts of series and they are really, really fun. I've been to a few and they're a place where fans gather not just to enjoy the music but also to share their love of the games. Nothing compares to the experience of watching the music from your childhood video games 
being played by a full symphony orchestra. It is absolutely fantastic. At one of the Zelda concerts, uh, I got to see Koji Kondo play Grandma's theme from Wind Waker on the piano, and I definitely cried a lot. One of the best things I've seen from the concerts is you can tell there's a lot of people who are taking their children to not only experience video game music for the first time, but also to experience a full-blown symphony orchestra, and that is a really powerful musical experience. You have people dressing up, you have people cheering and clapping for their favourite songs, you often have the composers in attendance, and they are really part of this gaming culture that has emerged where video games now aren't just something you do in the house, it's something that gets you out to events and to places with other people. As a kid I didn't really have a lot of people around me who were into gaming. Um, I had my brother and that was about it and me and my brother when we were teenagers we went to go see a Zelda concert and that was just a huge eye-opener because all of a sudden I wasn't this lone kid playing this game anymore and I didn't have anyone to talk to about it. There was all these people who were just as passionate, they had just as visceral emotional reactions to this music and it was a really, it was a really moving moment. I think that I get a lot of my emotional pain and kind of my existential doubt out through my music actually. I'm wondering, a lot of the Chinese room games are what is it like to be human? Why are we here? Like so many people get married to my music, people, I mean someone sent me recently a montage that his father had died and they'd cut together a film for the funeral and they'd used music from Rapture wow. and I think how extraordinary to have written music where that means so much to someone that they've used it to mark such an elemental, whether that is marrying or burying someone, but they, these are the, that's the real stuff of life. So for me, it's lovely having a BAFTA nook and a BAFTA, and, but for me, people doing that and writing to me saying, this has really touched me, that's why I do it. It's the best feeling and it's what matters, it's real. It's a very exciting time for music performance and music within games. There really is no limits to what can happen. But as much as I'd love to see a concert in VR or go and watch Marshmallow play in Fortnite, I don't think anything can truly take away from the experience of having people all around you and listening to the music live.